Hey, can you hear me? Hear you. It doesn't look like you're muted though, so maybe that's an issue on my end. There we go. I got you now. Yeah, that was my bad. Um, I hope we're not like locked. Oh, I'm sure they'll edit it. Oh, so. Yeah, this was a little, I was just hoping I was in the right place, honestly. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're in the right place. Yeah, the link, the link didn't go active until right at nine. So. Hopefully, now, hopefully Daniel's up. Oh yeah. It's probably like five where he's at. Yeah, probably, yeah, or or Max. Oh yeah, they're both from over there. Or or you know, the whole interview could just be me and you. Well, <laughs> we'll do our best between two exchange alum. Let's see here. Oh, I exited out of the schedule. Hmm. I know what I'll do. All right, I'm gonna run here. Uh, this Gmail right here. Just bring up everything that we've got. All right, yeah, so I sent a group email. Um, So how's it, how's it been going? It's it's good. It's a really nice day. I'm very tired from my program though. I forgot we had this this weekend. And so I just took like a oh, quiz. Oh, the recording button is on, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're live. Well, all right, since we are live, let's get started. So welcome to the We Represent Conference Summer Edition. I am Cameron Mealing, your moderator for today. Thank you all so much for attending. This is the Critical Language Scholarship where we will be discussing what it is like to do a CLS. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat and we will answer them by the end of the session. Uh, with me right now is Bridget Seeger. Seegers, yeah. Bridget Seegers. She's a first generation undergraduate student at Louisiana State University, where she majors in animal sciences and minors in wildlife ecology and linguistics. Bridget hopes to work as a global health veterinarian as the one health principle, which is the interdisciplinary approach to public health, recognizing the interconnected human and environmental health. She's interested in mitigating zoonotic diseases. Sorry, she is interested in mitigating zoonotic disease incident between human and wildlife populations, as well as developing sustainable livestock management in resource limited areas. Bridget loves exploring the intersection of environmental and cultural health. She is heavily involved in wetlands outreach education and is a fierce advocate for conservation and coastal restoration. Additionally, Bridget also supports reviving the language the Louisiana French vernacular and learning more about her Acadian heritage. Bridget is a strong believer 
that every academic interest can be enriched by language and culture studies inspired by her attendance at the last We Represent conference. She hopes to lead her university in developing a stronger community for its language learners and U.S. funded study abroad scholarship applicants. And she is currently studying Swahili as part of the 2021 Critical Language Scholarship Virtual Institute in Tanzania. And here we have joining us is Daniel, Daniel Lindenberg Lang. He is a he is an Austrian American. He's Austrian American and Chinese. He was born and raised in the American as the son of a Chinese immigrant mother. To honor his late mother, he and his siblings founded the Lin YL. Did I say that right? The Lin YL Foundation, which promotes equity by students who seek to pursue higher education. He's a storyteller, instructor, and mentor who serves as and he serves as the Nevada Advocacy Coordinator with the National Peace Corps Association. No matter where life finds him, he feels passionate about supporting his communities and bettering understandings. Daniel graduated with honors from the University of Nevada in 2019 with a BA in journalism. He, minors in he also minored in Chinese communications and English prior to the Peace Corps global evacuation of 2020. He served as an English and Chinese instructor at the National University of Mongolia Erdenet School. Dan Daniel studied abroad in 2008, language scholar to Xi'an, China. He went on to conduct Mandarin Chinese language research in Taiwan. And that spring, he coached Kiwanis CKI Servant Leadership Conference. Sorry about that. He had studied abroad in Shanghai, China in 2017 and had a, participated in a pilgrimage to Panama. So, how are y'all doing today? excited to be here i'm awake it is <laughs> i am <laughs> yeah we cover all different time zones so represent yeah, yeah we're we're all over america right now um so let's get into the questions so my first question is when did everyone here decide to apply for a CLS and why? Um, so my, how I came to CLS was kind of strange. I originally thought in high school that I wanted to study Russian. So I applied to the National Security Language Initiative for Youth Program for high schoolers, also by the U.S. State Department. But it wasn't tied to my career interests at all. So I got rejected. Um, but I told myself I would apply again for a similar program, but maybe it just maybe Russian and I weren't meant to be. And I was reading like a scientific article about um, what I want to do, global health in East Africa, when it hit me that Swahili is a CLS language. And kind of from then I was like, I have to apply like this is it. Um, and Swahili fits so seamlessly with my goals. Um, so, yeah, it was after I got rejected from another language in another program that I kind of realized another program, CLS, and another language, Swahili, fit what I wanted to do way better. All right, that's um, that's awesome. I actually got rejected from a Gilman before I did my Fulbright, so I can relate to that. Well, uh, Daniel, me, I, I'd, I'd seen a presentation when I was a freshman about the CLS and thought, oh, that looks really cool. It also seemed really difficult to get. So <laughs> I, at that time, I was in first year Chinese classes. So I figured, okay, its requirement is something like intermediate or advanced Chinese. So I thought, okay, I'll apply next year. So then a year passes. Now I'm a sophomore and I try applying, but I'm so busy and I'm also not that confident in my abilities that I pretty much put off my application until the very last 
two or three days before it was due, which I learned the hard way is a very bad idea for applying to anything. And I missed the application deadline. So I was very, very sad about that because I'd been like stressing about the application for weeks prior to actually finally starting it. So then I applied to a different scholarship program that was less competitive, also less funded, less prestigious, but still a China study abroad. And that brought me to my junior year of college when I was like, okay, this is the year we've waited now since freshman year, we're going to do it. And then I, I think I, gosh, I think I turned in that application almost as soon as it opened. Like it opened, I'm like, okay, I've had a whole year to think about it now. Did everything that I needed to do to get it turned in, turned it in pretty early and the rest is history. All right. So in your process for applying, um, who helped with your application? Well, kind of like you know, the first time I, um, well, I was like really ambitious um, going into college because I applied um, for CLS as a freshman. And so I think in September, I met with my advising department in our honors college and I said, I want to apply for CLS. Please don't tell me I can't. And they didn't. Um, they were really supportive and they were like, okay, when you have your application, just send it to us. Um, and then I waited very, very long, almost past the deadline before I started working on the application. And so I was so like embarrassed that I had procrastinated so much. I got peers to um, proofread it at the last minute. But other than that, that is no one really saw my application because I was too scared to send it to people and say, by the way, you have 24 hours to proofread this before I have to turn it in. So unfortunately, not a lot of people did end up reviewing my application. Um, thankfully, it just worked out. In my I also liaisoned with my honors college. The, well, at the time it was a program and now it's a college. Anyway, when I was first working on it, I sent it to the officer in the program who did scholarships. He gave me really good feedback that I felt too stressed to resolve at that time. But the next year, I, I was much more prepared of like, okay, I'm going to receive feedback that's going to feel extremely critical, but it's not actually meant to make me sad. It's meant to make me happier and help my application. So I think part of it with that is even though I had really expert opinion on it, I was... <laughs> to not ready for those that kind of high level feedback but the second year in addition to talking with like our honors college scholarship person i might have even sent it to our university writing center because by that time in my college career i'd gotten very good at making sure to plan weeks in advance before a deadline to send it through the university means in order to get very good feedback that i have plenty of time to incorporate and not stress nearly as much as I did the first time. All right. So, so you said an officer helped you with your um, application. So are there like resources that someone could go to at their university that can help? Yeah, I would think the first place to check would be to Google if your university has an office of scholarships or fellowships in my case, it was through the honors program office. So if someone was applying for a Fulbright or a Gilman or a Boren, that person would always want to go to this office, reach out to that person. And in my experience, at least, because now they've hired on another person who does this kind of work, those people have a very keen eye for what those applications look for. And at least at my university's case, that person is also willing to review applications, willing to review resumes, willing to review anything that you are thinking of using to promote yourself in these kinds of competitive scholarship situations. Otherwise, though, I think writing centers are also great because they tend to have people on staff, at least at a university, who might have gotten one of these scholarships before or has another professional background that can help you with tailoring these kind of applications and also checking for your grammar because that's also critical. Proofread mine were actually from the CLS Facebook. Um, there's a 
Facebook group for our CLS applicants. And all of my proofreaders were from there, people who were also applying or um, past alum who were willing to read it at very quick speeds. Um, and then yes, my university works a lot like Daniel's, it sounds like um, my Office of Fellowship Advising um, was the person I contacted. Um, so, so yes, if you go to a university structured kind of like ours, then that would be who you'd go to. But I know the Writing Center would be a great place as well. I know we have one. Um, and then Fulbright typically has its own office and universities if you're lucky enough. So lots of different places. All right. So, so it sounds like there's a Facebook group you can go to if your school doesn't have someone that directs in editing these types of applications. Um, so I want to ask you a question, which is how long did you spend on your application? And by that, do I mean like, what is the schedule for the application from the time that the competition opens up to the deadline? What would, uh, the schedule for a comp uh, application look like? I don't remember exactly the open date, maybe Dan shed light on that. It might be September, October-ish, if I'm remembering correctly, but I know it closes in November. Um, and I had literally had CLS on my calendar for since it's it opened, since the summer probably. But um, the first semester of college, especially in the pandemic, this was only a year ago or six months ago when I was applying really. Um, it was just a lot tougher than I expected and I didn't really have time um, to to apply, really fill out that application. Um, so I did end up waiting two weeks before the deadline, but I just set aside my entire life for those two weeks and went to a coffee shop and was just cranking out essay answers and spent very long hours at a coffee shop. By the end of it, like everyone in that coffee shop knew my name. And after two weeks, I had a solid application that I was ready to submit and just be done with, send it off into the world. Um, but I do want to say, don't be afraid if you apply, if you think you're applying late. Um, I know people, I'm not recommending this. I'm just saying, don't let it hold you back. If you apply at the last minute, if you've only given yourself five days to do the application, but it's something you're passionate about, go for it. The worst they can tell you is not this year, sorry and you have the experience of already applying once. So if you wait till the last minute, don't bully yourself out of not applying. Go ahead and give it a shot. All right, Daniel, what about you? I was trying to look through my schedule, like my agenda on Google calendars to see, okay, when, what weeks and what days was I working on this thing? And the, I, I don't see exactly like how many hours because it, it, it's just there's a lot of things I was doing during that time. But uh, based on what I am seeing, I think what I'd done is I'd looked up the prompts for the scholarship based on the year before it and it kind of pre-drafted what I think I might say like as I, I had a whole year. So it's kind of like if something popped up in my life that I'm like, oh, this might be relevant. I just chucked it in a Google Doc so that I, I had that available to me. And then when it opened, I kind of formalized it, tried to make it look okay, sent it to the offices to, to review it. And then it, I think it was like, according to this calendar, it looks like I'd set aside completely the entire day before the deadline to just kind of check everything over again, make sure it looks good. But the the real front end work of it was, was a process that I just did over time without really stressing about it too much, especially since the previous year I tried to apply for it and then just didn't. So <laughs> I had plenty of time to reflect on my answers. So it sounds like I guess if you uh, put your nose to the grindstone, you can get it out in two weeks, but that is not recommended. So you should probably plan ahead. Um, my next question is, all right. I want each of you to think back to when you were bright eyed and bushy tailed and the CLS was no more than a twink. Ah, what advice would you give to the about getting started?
That is a that is a good question. Um, I would anytime I'm asked like what would I do to my future self, it's always give myself a hug um, and tell myself it's gonna work out. Like it always works out. Um, I would literally just tell myself apply and be. Don't be afraid to like try to be authentic as possible um, with these applications. Um, be yourself. And that's so cliche, but it's really easy with this to try to model yourself after some alum, you know, or who you think the program wants. When in reality, the program could just want you. You just have to show them who you are. Um, so I think and kind of giving context to that situation, there are some questions on the exam and on the application. Um, like there's one about resilience and how are you in new environments? And I was really tempted to try to put um, any experience I've had engaging with people who speak a foreign language or something. But in my history, those are not the experiences where I've had to be the most resilient in new environments. Um, so I ended up not putting any evidence that I'd ever really had international cultural exchange so much as the ones I've actually had domestically. Um, and I think that was true to me and it read more authentic in the end. Um, and even in my cohort, I'm one of the least traveled persons in my class of six. So, um, but that doesn't make me any less suitable for the program. So be yourself and don't seriously just get out of your own head and, and know that you, you're probably a prime applicant Everybody who's on the program once was an applicant, so it could be you apply, believe that you can do it. Um, yeah, don't don't psych yourself out before you start. Um, just be yourself. Try to be true to who you are. Let your application read like like uh, a reflection of who you are. I really echo what Bridget said, and that is in part because my application was very fueled by diversity experiences. And I think even when I got on the program, more so that, where we had people from small colleges, large universities, private institutions, public institutions, people who'd never been abroad before, people who've been abroad lots of times, it really showed me how pretty much anybody could be qualified for the scholarship, which leads me to say that everybody can be qualified for the scholarship. And I remember going into the application process, hearing about in some years as selective as 10% or less, just depending on how competitive the year is with how many people apply. That felt really discouraging to me at first. But after having gotten accepted, I realized it's part of that accessibility that makes it competitive. The sense that there's so many people who could be suitable for the program that it's like if you don't put your hat in the race then there's no chance of winning and i think as with many competitive scholarship applications it's it's often and i found this when i was a freshman like i didn't realize how often it is that i am qualified for these things and that low acceptance rate shouldn't deter me but let me know that this is something that's respected in such a way that people want to attend it, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily harder to attend it because there's so many factors in the selection process that are outside our control. So again, I echo what Bridget said about putting who you are out there, whatever your story is, is the way that you have a shot at getting accepted. But definitely believe you can. That is step one. And Gosh, you know, if I believed that when I was a sophomore, maybe I could have gotten it then. I like it. I like it. Be yourself and, and embrace your originality. Let it come through your education. Um, my next question is, were you applying to any other opportunities other than CLS? I mean, is it even possible to do a CLS and another program at the same time? I like that. I think the answer is no. Like you can apply to Fulbright and CLS, but if you get them both, you have to choose. Uh, in my case, I was CLS or bust. I was like, I 
I was just like, I'm a freshman. We're in a pandemic. I'm going to apply to CLS and that'll be that. Um, and then going to re-represent um, a few months ago, then I learned about Warren Fulbright, um, all the rest of the State Department's little gang of awesome exchange programs. So no, at the time when I was applying for CLS, it was my only one that I was applying for. Um, but we've had alum from other programs on our on in our current cohort. Um, but but yeah, I don't think you can do CLS concurrently with any other program. So my answer is no, I wasn't applying to anything else. And for me, I definitely wanted CLS more than other scholarship types of study abroad programs. But if I remember correctly, I did have other university sponsored exchanges on my radar with the idea that okay, if CLS doesn't work out, I could apply through other means if I want to go back abroad and keep learning my target language. Thankfully, I didn't have to engage those alternative routes my second year, but my first year, that's pretty much exactly what I did. I reached out to my university study abroad offices and investigated what kinds of study abroads did they have, did they have that were affordable, that they also had scholarships for, not fully funded, not as prestigious, not as intensive, but still study abroad programs. So I sort of didn't apply for other things while applying for CLS, but had them in the back burner and in certain cases could use prompts from the CLS and shift them a little bit for my other scholarship essays. All right. That, um... question is, is there a research project that uh, requirement? And if there is, uh, what did you do? I think CLS is unlike, uh, I believe that question's applicable to right and perhaps born as well, where if you do research, you can kind of bring it with you in your host country, which is kind of awesome. But um, with CLS, that's that's not really something I think um, our program does. It's more just a strict learning language learning um, immersion program. So so no, um, you can conduct like you can do art and and interact with the local community when you're um, in your host country in a normal year. Obviously, I'm virtual, but. Um, yeah, we, we have PhD students who conduct research, but they're not actively conducting it while on program. Um, no. So if that's something big to any applicants, maybe look to the other programs. Or if you just want an isolated language experience, this is definitely the program for you. That said, there's also ways that if you are research focused, you can position that in your application. The reason I say that is because what Bridget said is exactly right. In the program itself, it's not research structure. But in my application process, talking with my advisor, he mentioned to me how with these kinds of programs, there's a good sense of needing to demonstrate your attachment to a language, your passion for learning the language, and what you want to do with the language. And so in my case, I had and still have a lot of interest and researching things about China. And so I positioned in my application how, since I had to do a senior thesis, the topic I was interested in pursuing would be Chinese language research for that thesis. So that was part of my application. And also when I went on the CLS program, I was able to, at some point, kind of midway through the program, sit down with some of the language teachers one-on-one -on -one and work on vocabulary that could help me conduct my research. So in a roundabout way, I was able to use research interests and pursue research goals, but it was more staging for what I would later do rather than actually doing it on my CLS program. So if you are interested in research, but you really need to get language skills, this could also be very useful for you as it was for me. So it sounds like the language is the research with the program. Um, Daniel, this is a, a this one's for you. You said you 
Choi, loaded up the whole application, looked over everything, worked on my essays, and then just didn't turn it in in time. <laughs> so, like, you, uh, a college graduate to receive the CLS? Oh, no. On my program, I even had people who I think were rising freshmen who just finished high school. So, I, I mean, I was kind of shocked. I thought, dang, I should have applied as a freshman and just seen what happened. <laughs> So I was imagine if you were like an ambitious high school in the college, like you could probably throw your hat into the ring and see, see what happens. These kinds of programs too, often it is favorable to apply again, even if you're rejected and then be able to supplement what you've done in the year since your first application. Because if the admissions team is the same as it was the year before and you keep building on your story, Eventually, they'll probably take a hint. Wow, you really, really want to go on this program. So it's like, see, try, try again. Um, all right, Bridget, I, w I want you to answer this one first because I remember you said something about like a, a two week grind. Um, th thinking right within two weeks thinking about the first draft of your application and the final draft what were some of the major changes that you made definitely just the overarching content it's so this application is is easy and hard at the same time it's a very simple straightforward application and that's what makes it so difficult because you're presenting why you deserve this um in such short word counts um i think have, how the CLS application works is you get one personal statement, which is kind of longer, and then you are you get four very specific prompts, I think 200 to 350 words each. Um, and I, I think it's resilience, preparation for the CLS program, commitment to language study, um, one more, uh, maybe about, there's there's one about your personal background. Um, so, so it's... Um, it's hard because you have to kind of pick like one one main experience to highlight in each thing is what is the approach I took. But I do want to preface there are multiple approaches that are successful. Um, but for the resilience essay, who um, like what what experiences do you have in a new environment that makes you successful? I was like, OK, I want to focus on one experience that shows my resiliency um, and I think at first I was picking speaking Spanish with extended family, which just didn't showcase what I needed it to. But that was because I was trying to force a very international perspective. I ended up going with um, interacting with the local homeless communities when um, I was going to like vaccinate the pets of the homeless, which is a very resiliency building experience um, and was more true to myself and my career plans and what I'm doing. Um, so sometimes the entire topic changed in those two weeks. Um, I would just sit and like beat my head because there were two essays that just weren't really working for me. The topic I had chosen to highlight just wasn't, wasn't working. I knew it was, it was reading inauthentically. It wasn't answering the question. So yeah, sometimes entire content changed. And then sometimes my proofreaders would be like, this sentence makes so much more sense if it just goes a little bit higher up in your paragraph. And I'd be like, oh, wow, you're so right. Because when you stare at something for two weeks straight, it all just becomes words at the end of the day. And it's very, you get in such, like once I sent the application off, it felt like I sent my child off to, that I like didn't, I didn't even know my child anymore. I'm just like, take it. Um, but, but yeah, um, so sometimes entire content changed and I really did look for online resources, blogs. I went to CLS sessions that CLS itself hosts on the CLS website. There's webinar, there's webinars you can access. Um, basically, if the CLS program had tips, application tips out there, I tried to take them and use them to kind of um, make my essays more concise and more effective. Unfortunately, with the limited word counts, every sentence has to mean something. So sometimes I was just taking out fluff sentences, maybe sentences I was attached to, but they weren't really the most important aspect of my application. 
So, and then at the end, it was just kind of making sure that my personal statement and then my four essays read together well. You could tell the same person had wrote them and they helped expand on each other. So, so yeah, over the two weeks, we had a lot of changes for sure. And I say we, meaning like me and my two proofreaders. Can I add something to this question? Oh, go ahead. Or Some great advice I got on how to think of those essays is to think of them as one continuous story. So what Bridget was talking about, about making sure that they sound like they're written by the same person. When I drafted them, I, like my actual response is, I probably drafted twice as many words for each prompt as ultimately I'd be permitted to use. And I think that's a really good practice for these situations where you only get 150 or 250 words because sometimes worrying so much about the word limit stifles your creativity to be able to actually write what you need to tell somebody. And I found that sometimes an anecdote I might have had could fit in more than one answer. So by having drafted it out the long form, I could kind of splice it and decide, okay, this fits better here, this fits better there. And that helped me to feel like I said what I wanted to say, even if I didn't put it where I initially thought it would fit. So it's okay to write more than you need because ultimately at the end of the day, you just got to shrink it down. But that's another way to go about it where it makes it less stressful. And I think that's ultimately super important for any kind of major competitive application like this one. Less time stressing and more time feeling like you can do this. I like it. So saying that we need a lot, write a lot, and then you chop it down, condense it to its purest form, and rearrange and tell a better story. I guess that's why you're the master storyteller. What are some that for applying? I think one thing I really didn't expect from like these programs when I was considering um, or rejected from, I should say, uh, the National Security Language Initiative, um, which is CLS for high schoolers to some extent. Um, and I was learning about CLS, Boren, Fulbright, all these exchange programs through the US State Department. I didn't realize that one of the coolest aspects of this program is literally the alumni. Um, there are some really impressive, very approachable people who have done these programs. And that's why, um, like in the Facebook group, there was an alumni who was willing to read my essays who didn't know me, which honestly was even better because they, that's that an, ap an application grader is not going to know you when they read your essay. Um, so, so yeah, the alumni, um, I wish I had known to not be so afraid to reach out to people. Um, so if you're at this conference, you're already that step one is to just see see the different faces that participate in these um, awesome programs. Um, so, I, yeah, I wish I knew to reach out to alumni more. Um, there's some awesome friends. I'm virtual and my cohort class, um, my beginner class, we are we are tight um, and it's only been three weeks. So this program really does build some great relationships. Um, and I I had just kind of wished that I knew um like I was enough, um, my background, my interest. Um, I don't have to you know, constantly keep saying, oh, am I as cool as this person? Am I like that person has such a more relevant background than me or they're already so much better at Swahili than me. Like you were chosen for the program. If you get chosen, they believe in you and they want your individual success. Um, CLS is a very, um, flexible program as much as it can be for your needs. So if you're on program and, you know, you feel like you're falling behind, you can get help if you need help. Um, they they want you. CLS is just one of those things where more um, qualified people apply than what where there are seats for. And that's why alternates are selected in case any finalists um, end up declining the program. Those alternates are just as qualified as the first round of finalists. It's just one of those programs where there's so many qualified people. Um, 
and there's a, unfortunately a limited number of seats. So that's why we say apply because you don't know if you can't, if you're one of those ideal applicants. And then if you, um, if, if you are struggling to kind of think if, if this is right for you, on, on one note, um, trust the application process. Um, if someone's applying to CLS for a vacation, the application will vet them out, we hope. So um, if you are selected, know that, you know, it's because you have, you've shown that you are a prime candidate for the, for the program. So um, yeah, for me, it's like, I wish I would have known to reach out to alumni. And I wish even like once I got the program, I kind of had it in my head more that you've been chosen, like they believe in you. So believe that you can do this because it is, I mean, I applied as an absolute beginner. Um, so it is kind of daunting when you're in the room with people who speak almost fluent Swahili already who are on program with you as well. So, so yeah, those are kind of like my insights. I wish I would have told myself. Um, and I wish I would have told myself, you're about to have a blast. This is about to be such a crazy, awesome experience. There it is. So I heard um make I just want to add to that so it can be a testament to it that like I was a Fulbright alumni ambassador and that's how I met uh, I met and that I believe CLS ambassadors that you can read it reach out to. So I can tell you from personal that, that we'd love to know some So don't be afraid. Daniel, uh, what, what about, about you? Do you, you have any uh, tips that you wish you would have? That's been this whole conversation. But in all seriousness, I really thought something similar to Bridget, but about the cohort while on the I think in my application process, I was, th I was so much more eye-focused. What do I want to get out of the program? What do I want to do? But on or we focus out of the program and the sense of who gets to do it. Like I'd originally been looking at it more, am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? Will will they think I'm like cool? But on the program, I I mean it felt some bell curve of society, like there were lots of people from public universities like me on this program. There were handfuls of people from smaller schools because there's handfuls of small schools. And there were maybe only a few from top big universities. And after the program, I remember talking to some of my friends who I'd known in high school who went on to much now, I remember them talking about how they were interested in things like the CLS or they were talking about wanting to maybe apply to it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, wait, people at top universities think about applying to the CLS, which is something that I, like it me to wrap my head around how significant of a program it is that no matter where you're attending school right now or will attend, you could still be the exact kind of person that they're looking for. So myself got really, really modified when I was on this program among my cohort, realizing that we were all equally qualified in this program, no matter where we wound up going to school and what we were, we were joined by that passion to learning this language. And of course, now that is my alumni community, that that's now, I'm engaging with working with but even just as a participant if if i'd known how exciting it would be to be a, like co like my cohort i think i would have been much again much more eager and much less oh my god if my good enough at the language where i'm going to figure it out because ultimately we had a placement test anyway so the stellar students who've been studying this language forever got placed at the highest level. We who were mid-range got placed in the mid-range level. And so we worked where we were and we improved from there. Oh, so there's like a so there's like a placement test besides where you go. Insider secrets from CLS uh, alum is that 
you report you you tell the uh, application how long you've been studying the language but then you take a you'll take a test with your actual university your program um when you're there that decides what class you get put into so if you've been studying for a year but you still feel like you're terrible or maybe you feel like you're amazing though you've only studied a year don't sweat it they will give you a placement program um, that's not the OPI. A lot of times we think you get a, you get an oral proficiency exam before and after your program, which is actually just for state department purposes, not for your own placement. When you're on program in your host country, studying with your particular institution, that's when you'll get a placement test, which obviously will make you make sure you end up in the right classroom. And then if you have any concerns, you can express them like, I think I am more advanced or I think I feel comfortable for farther behind. Um, so, so yeah, don't, don't like eh, when you're reporting your, your experience with the language, be honest for sure. But um, don't, don't be nervous about that because you'll get a placement um, test later on. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's something I didn't realize until on um, program. We thought that how we were reported um, in our application was what class we ended up in. But just learning ability gets so, it, it's so diverse um, and length is not an adequate like amount of time to to know how far along you are. So, so yeah, you will get a um, language test in your program. Don't worry about it. <laughs> For both of you, how has COVID impacted your CLS? Like, uh, uh, well, story of my program, right? Uh, I am currently on the virtual institute, um, which application process is the same. Um, I'm, I love how they kept the application process the same because everyone's application experience, um, virtual or, or um, in person, like Daniel's program was, um, our application experience is very, very similar still. Um, I think for me, uh, besides um, doing the program um, virtually now, um, when I was applying, I was applying through COVID as a first semester college student. So that's that contributed to why I applied so last minute because every it was just a hard adjustment period. And it was really hard to feel motivated and invest in your future experiences because you just didn't know like the state, how the world was going to be. Um, you didn't know if you were applying to an in-person or virtual program. I ended up saying, I want to learn Swahili regardless. And if this is going to help me a little, then that's what I want. Um, and now that I'm on program um, virtually, uh, Monday through Friday, I have class for two hours. I have a phone call conversation or a FaceTime conversation uh, with my language partner two hours a week. Um, Wednesdays, we have an hour long cultural session. We do homeworks. We listen to music. Um, it is as much um, immersion as we can manage on a virtual program. And we did receive a stipend this summer to help with technology costs, which has been awesome. Um, so as far as virtual programs go, I think CLS sets a high bar. Um, I feel I know I've learned a lot more than I would have gotten had I not had I tried to study on my own this summer, basically, and made many more connections. So I'm very grateful to be, still be part of this program. Unfortunately, I don't think we know um, for sure the state of CLS. They're not going to release that until the next application. Um, is open. They're not going to say we're doing it in person. We're doing it virtually. Um, but they're, they're, the State Department and CLS in general, American councils, they're very invested in making sure the virtual institutes run well. And I think it shows because we've had no problems. The instruction's been great. Um, and I'm just all around very, very grateful. Um, still very much feels like CLS um, and the experience I was hoping for. Um, and I'm really excited to take my OPI at the end of the program to see how much I've advanced because I know it will be substantial considering I knew very, very little um, at the start. And if anything, it's only encouraged me that maybe I need to apply to another US funded exchange program so that I can go to my, my host country, which is Tanzania for me, 
um, so that I can I can meet these awesome people that I see every day on a screen and uh, eat this food that I cook alone in my home um, with my classmates on Zoom, you know, like um, it's just encouraged me further. And I think it's been the best it has been given the circumstances. So um, if 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 it is virtual or if there's virtual opportunities in the future, take them. There's still good opportunities is kind of my my piece of advice. So we're gonna we're gonna find out if they return to the less, but like right now they're doing it virtually. Program. I'm not. Sh I think they actually had. Um, I'm. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this. Oh, but these CLS oh, applicants, the CLS the finalists for um, Korea and I think China. They had the option, like they could tell the State Department whether or not they wanted to go in person or not. And I'm not sure how that program actually played out because there were quarantine things. I believe based on country, they were doing their best to try to offer in-person experiences. I don't think it ended up um, happening. I think they might all be virtual this year, but I'm really I'm not positive on that. Some CLS participants might have opted to go in person, do like three weeks of quarantine, three weeks of learning in person. Um, so moral of the story, they tried. They really did their best, but um, they have to follow the overarching State Department travel guidelines, which I think are scaled back to please don't travel. Um, so, yeah, once you see those lifted, then then State Department will probably be considering more um, in person. And then you can always try to See, like if Boren's in person this year, that's a really good indicator that Boren will be in person next year, which might be a really good indicator that CLS is in person next year. These things we don't know for sure, but um, you can kind of just look at it, try to feel it out, try to try to guess, and and they try to communicate. The program does try to communicate as much as possible. There, there are some things they're secretive or not necessarily secretive, but just quiet about. And that's mainly because they don't want to do any false advertising. They want, don't want to tell you something that's not true or that they're unsure about. Something oh, so. big to oh, keep in ahead. mind with any State Department sponsored program is that ultimately it's a government agency. So the reputation of the agency is important, which means that they don't want to put out information that they can't make promises on. So in my case, I was in the Peace Corps when the pandemic began. And I actually applied for the Peace Corps months right after I got back from my CLS in part for similar reasons to what Bridget said about wanting to actually spend more time in that part of the world. In my case, I'd been to Asia now on a 10 week program or eight week program with CLS. And I thought, wow, I, I need a lot more time doing this kind of stuff. And so, I'd met a returned Peace Corps volunteer on pretty much my last week in CLS. And it was encouraged to me by one of my friends on CLS to meet this guy. I met this guy and thought, oh, Peace Corps sounds like a cool thing to do when I graduate. So I went on to the Peace Corps, pandemic happened, and we got evacuated back in March 2020. So a great resiliency statement for my future applications. But the, uh, I guess the upshot of that has really been CLS is a kind of program that many of my advisors tell me is a gateway program where it's so short, but it really prepares a recipient to go on to future types of prestigious study abroad programs. I usually looked at that more from a resume perspective of, oh, look, I survived in an intensive language environment of cultural exchange, and I didn't upset the US government. So I won't upset your program either. But I personally look at that and think, now that I've had a taste, I want the, the big thing. And so I think that I've looked a lot at the pandemic as a lot of opportunities to reconnect with people throughout the pandemic. I've actually reached out to my language partners from CLS. And now this is two, almost three years since my program. And even yesterday, one of my teachers of my main CLS class that I go to Monday through Friday, she was texting me a grammar question about English. And she texts the question in Chinese, but just asks about a few things in English. And then 
I just text her back some my response, practicing my Chinese, talking about English. And she sent me some grammar corrections because I wrote it a little weird in Chinese. And I'm like, it's perfect. I'm still practicing my Chinese with my CLS people, even back on the other side of the world. So it, I've been making the most of it. And I think that with any crisis, there's always an opportunity. You just can't escape those who are home. That was a, that was a, that was a nice resume, resume for that. Yeah. Not for everybody. Sorry, which thing am I saying again? The, the oh, every oh, crisis oh, has oh, an opportunity? Oh, oh, it was the phrase you said you put on your resume. I thought it was really nice. I totally wanted to steal it for my own. Oh, life. yeah. I, seeing so it as a resume opportunity, but that personal stuff. Yes. It's like so, you, you went on a prestigious program and the US State Department didn't get mad at you and <laughs> at it. Yeah. I like that. I, I agree. I think I love what you said about CLS being a gateway program because coming in, there are people we have of all ages doing the program from an entering freshman to college who's done like dual enrollment in high school. They're eligible occasionally, which is probably who you were on program with, Daniel. Um, and then there's PhD students in their last year of their PhD on program. It's a very diverse group um, as far as education level. Um, but I think, like, I really do look at CLS as a gateway program, not, and like it, everything that comes after now is going to build off of this CLS experience. This is my foundational language skills. Um, and I want to stress that CLS is a language program and the language is so important. Um, I don't now I'm kind of considering or at least asking more questions about, hey, is Fulbright is born um, something for my future, something to consider? Um, whereas I would not be asking those questions had I not gotten CLS because I wouldn't feel equipped with the language. Um, but but now I feel I feel good. I mean, my my Swahili still needs a lot of work, but. I feel equipped to be dropped into a, a foreign country as as long as the U.S. State Department is, you know, padding me with some resources and some resident directors, you know, and some uh, some cohort members to support me along the way. So, so yeah, I, I think of it as a gateway program, too. And it's it's a really huge gate uh, and there's a lot waiting behind it. So now that I'm equipped with this experience, these people, this language, it really does feel like there's a a whole world out there just um, waiting to, to be explored. Um, uh, going to wait. I provide comment. <laughs> Well, as far as gateway things go too, I would say that things like Fulbright weren't even on my radar prior to CLS. And I think that going back to something that Bridget and I have said throughout this talk, that sense of self-worth, like, whoa, we, we, gotta, we gotta remind ourselves that we are worthy and 
some of the best advice I'd gotten even recently for applications like these is to actually, I think it was a COS alumni talk, but having a mentality of instead of thinking, I want to do this, think I deserve to do this. And of course, maybe not necessarily write it that way on the application, but have that be the mantra in my head instead of, oh, it would be nice, uh, it would be cool, more, I deserve this. And then it helps me create the reasons, why do I deserve this? Why am I worthy? Why am I as qualified as everybody else? So keep those things in mind for even alumni. We still, after all this time, have to remind ourselves that we are worthy and capable individuals. I some of those things you've said have just been totally my experience as well. Um, when you mentioned being on program, it becomes more of a we than I, whereas the application is I, 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 and the program is we, we, we. And they say that, um, you know, CLS is a team program and you have to be equipped for that. And that doesn't mean if you're an introvert, which I am, or if, if social situations maybe make you nervous, um, that the program's not for you. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that that you have to come in wanting to to be open to building these relationships and and supporting your classmates and even through a virtual setting um my cohort and i have hopped on zoom to practice things that one of us might be struggling with more than the other it really does become a team thing and you realize you just want everyone to succeed in your class it 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 really it does become this whole team thing like how can how can we lift each other up and support each other um and I think CLS is one of those programs that when they have applicants, they're not necessarily saying, oh, Daniel's super bright program. They're thinking like, oh, this is this awesome perspective Daniel provides. We want someone with this perspective on our program. And then they're going to keep picking people who they like the perspective of. Um, and to where when they present their cohort, they cover so many vast perspectives. It's like, look, look at all these different people. I know my class of six is so diverse and, and sometimes in the strangest ways. We have military um, in our, our program. We have people from all ethnicities. Oh, we just lost our moderator. Um, uh, it's, it's really um, interesting. Uh, and it's really interesting to see like what brings people to study um, the language. I know we we have a lot of STEM people in our class. Um, so yeah, I really felt like it became more of a team program than anything. Um, once it's like once you're in, it's like change your change your mindset. Like this is this is go time now um, to really be a team program. So I concur so heavily with with like that point you made for sure. See on my screen, my I'm up. so oh, I guess maybe my internet connection. But if any of you have questions, or write them in the QA, except I don't know QA, but I know for sure we could read the chat. So <laughs> if there are things you want to ask us in the um, oh, our moderators are free to ask because you can certainly feel this. I'm Jessica, just hopping in in case Cameron is continuing with his difficulties. But um, so I, I try to listen to the whole conversation, but I had a question about host families. Was that, that discussed? I know with in person, some programs have living situations. So that might be a question for Daniel. Oh, <laughs> take that one. <laughs> Everything is loading so slowly. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's Jessica. Woo! Hi, Daniel. 
So I hope you can hear me. I just had a question about host families and if your program had that. Mine didn't, but I'm aware that some sites do. And I recall in my application process, there was a, somewhere, maybe it was after I was accepted, but a question asking if I was like seeking an apartment situation or a host family situation. And I recall in somewhere on my application describing how I'd been in international home stays before. I looked at it from an resilience that wherever the department program coordinators find me most suited, depending on what they have available, that I could comfortably adapt to it. So I found that an important thing to consider location that uh, the prompts, if you people look over the prompts. They really look for how to change the situation, how do you remain flexible and don't just give up when the going gets. So on my program specifically, it didn't have host families, but I'm pretty sure there were other program sites that they could have placed me at where I would have had a host family. Oh, can anyone hear me? Got you back, Cameron. <laughs> All right. Yeah, those technical difficulties, uh, the page became unresponsive. So what was, uh, what was that last question? About host families, um, I just know some programs have the living situation where you will be placed with the host family. For example, with Persian, they I think they typically place you with the host family who you stay with for the whole duration mm -hmm. of the program. Well, yeah, that's how um, that's how Swahili works. You are placed in um, a host family in Arusha, Tanzania, very close to the the institution. So yeah, I know some some programs do. Um, like they can do dorm type living, but um, I know that uh, Swahili in a normal year, yeah, we're we're a, um, a host family program as well. Um, I have a question. So, um, are you currently doing your CLS, Bridget? I literally had class yesterday. I'll have class Monday. I'm mid program right now. And Daniel, you did. Daniel, was your CLS virtual or in country? Mine was in country back in the summer of 2018, about a year and a half before everything started locking down. I'm the lucky okay. one. So my question is, I just kind of wanted to compare and contrast like a workload to a CLS versus a in country CLS. So if, if Bridget, you can go through what a normal day for your CLS looks like, and then Daniel, you can go after. If I had to like conjecture what I think the differences are, um, I do think I would have learned a lot more in country because um, you actually have the chance to explore around your host country, um, go to the market and practice those language skills or speak to your host family. Um, whereas, um, the programs I miss, the program aspects I'm missing specifically are um, not not being there, not having um, the chance to travel around and, and visit um, areas in the, the host town um, and then all, not have a host family, which when you're living with someone, it really does increase your your language ability. Um, so on any given day, like may, we'll say Monday, um, I will have a one hour conversation FaceTime with my language partner um, who's someone near my age who's fluent in Swahili and will speak in Swahili um, for an hour. And then I head to my Zoom class. Um, I have six classmates. It's a beginner class um, with with um, our teacher, our Mwalimu, who is awesome. We seriously have a great, great instructor. Um, and then we have an hour of class, we take a 10 minute break, and then we do another hour of class, um, which is grammar, vocab, reading. Um, and then at the end of the class, we might 
um, just try to ask each other questions about our week just to get more speaking practice in. Um, and then we'll have homework, which can honestly depend. Sometimes homework is very quick. And then sometimes homework is like two hours of playing the same recording like five times because you're like, what is that word they're saying? I don't know. And then um, I, I've tried to change it up. Like I'll go to coffee shops to take my to take my classes. Um, just um, try to keep things fresh because you can get fatigued, especially. I think we've all experienced Zoom fatigue, but um, it is difficult navigating a language, um, even through a virtual setting. Um, and then I also, Tuesdays, I have a consultation with um, my teacher. So um, if I do have any questions throughout the week or if I need a chance to just ask questions, you have that opportunity um, on, on our program. Um, and then Wednesday, like I think cultural aspects is something that's very hard to convey over Zoom, but they've really done their best. Um, every Wednesday we'll have a cultural activity for an hour. Um, so far we've done, we've learned about um, a, a, a catering business in the area, um, a local mining business. Um, we've learned about tribe, tribes um, and some of them do like blacksmithing work. So we learned about that. Um, so I definitely feel, I feel like as far as the culture goes and as far as the feel for the country goes, I feel like I'm being prefaced with a lot of great information, but yeah, I am going to have to go there to kind of really understand everything. Um, but I've, I've done the most I can. I cook, um, Tanzanian cuisine and there are cooking lessons later on in our instruction plan. So they, they do their absolute best, but, but yeah, I feel I feel like like Daniel might have really fun experiences of going to places, stores, interacting with the locals where I, unfortunately, I'm just going to have my language partner and my teacher who are like my consistent native speakers I interact with. I think. All right, Daniel. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, it sounds like uh, Bridget has a future study abroad opportunity planned to go to East Africa. Use some of that Swahili. Only Swahili word I know is Simba, and that's from The Lion King. Uh, uh, Daniel, well, what about your experience? Yeah, that's more words than me in Swahili. With the in-person aspect of the program, listening to Bridget talk, it actually made me consider how, yes, a lot of things are more accessible in person, but the the participant needs to put in the effort. I think, for example, about the language policy, where we're supposed to, at least in CLS Chinese, since people are supposed to have some background knowledge, where students are only supposed to speak in the target language. So a student on CLS Chinese should only be speaking Chinese. And a lot of students really to, to skirt that sometimes or wanted a break from the language policy. Whereas I was like, no, I'm going all in. I'm only speaking the language. And I found that there were lots of opportunities where it really is easy to not speak the language. Like being among fellow Americans, one can easily speak English to fellow Americans and then lose out on opportunities to practice the target language. So for me, I would try to seek out like coffee shops, sit down, listen in just around me, get the kind of passive learning while actively learning situations. But at the same time, I mean, we could walk up to our language partners, like knock on their door and talk to them without having to do a Zoom call and get the time zones to straighten out. So they were more accessible in that sense. But then at the same time, there were people who just stayed in their rooms all day and then didn't go out and go to the coffee shops, go to the libraries, talk to people. So those people, I don't know, maybe could have benefited from the virtual environment where at least there was more structured talk to this person at this time, talk to this person at that time. I would also add that there are a lot more opportunities for random chance language experiences where if one is walking down the street country 
some random person could approach you and talk to you. And that's an experience you wouldn't have staring at your computer screen. It's not like you can just take yourself and put yourself in a physical environment. But someone has to be on the other end to pick up your call, so to speak, and literally. So I think that those were definitely areas where it affected the workload. But I think class-wise, workload-wise, probably similar. Like my mornings, I would have a morning more grammar reading focused class. Then about mid-morning, closer to 10-ish, after having a short break, we'd have a more speaking focused class. Then we'd have our lunchtime. After lunch, there'd usually be enough time to maybe meet with a language partner or take a nap, as I often did because I was just so tired. Then we'd have an afternoon class that was more culturally geared. It would rotate a bit more, but we also had an elective. So uh, depending on the day of the week, it'd be either we go to our elective. In my case, it was a newspaper reading class. So more reading focused, but not as vocabulary focused as here's a current event, let's talk about it. And some days of the week, we'd have a cultural excursion where we would do something like go to a location. I think a big difference though is the weekend excursions because on our program, there would be field trip situations where we would go to some other area of the country, learn about the local, learn about the local area. Those are things that are very hard to replicate virtually. And after those excursions, we usually had to give a speech report. So again, it didn't really affect the workload that much, but it definitely affected how we had opportunities to practice the language, which to me, ultimately, I guess the philosophic work of the program is the interacting with people as well as the learning of the language, even if it's not some worksheet or some assignment. All right, that's my first time in the country. I always like to go on a walk and get lost in a city. And it sounds like that's what you like to do too. Um, next question is, we actually only have about uh, a minute left. So do we have any uh, closing statements from our panelists? Apply, if you're watching this video, um, apply or encourage others to do so. This could be the program for you. We're all people. Um, alumni can sometimes seem really awesome, bigger than life, have really long resumes, but they're just human beings at the end of the day that would probably love to talk to you and share their experience with you. So learn critical languages, apply for CLS. And Daniel? As I have done throughout the hour, I will echo Bridget and also say that don't be intimidated if you thought my resume was long. I am a to talk to you too. So yeah, do feel free to reach out to me, reach out to fellow alumni, or in Bridget's case, program participants. Of course, she might be busy doing so it's okay. Don't worry if she doesn't reply immediately. But of course, yes, reach out. You have a taste with more information. Now dive in, get more information, and work hard at it. All right. Well, uh, that is all the time that we have today. Uh, thank you for coming to the Critical Language Scholarship. And thank you so much to Bridget and Daniel for speaking with us today. Um, if you're comfortable, please, uh, my, this is comfortable, uh, you can drop your email in the chat for attendees to contact you if they have further questions. And uh, lastly, uh, to the guests, please check your inbox on Monday for our conference survey. It will help us with funding and improve next year. Next for our conference is abroad. Uh, Enjoy the break and see you again. Oh, Daniel, we got to get away from you. All right.
Well, I'll be in the networking session. Take care.